Well, this week there seems to be a sense of newness and freshness as some of our churches have commenced worship again, at least in a restricted format. And there is a sense of newness and freshness as we enter ordinary time, what has also been called the season after Pentecost, or simply green time. As a church leader, I like the chance to put on the green because it marks a period in our church life where there are less big festivals and less community events to deal with and therefore there's more time to reflect, to plan and to grow in our faith. This greenness is a little reminder that growing like simple blades of grass is what we are doing as disciples of Christ. It's a comfort to be in ordinary time and it's a comfort to be getting back into Matthew's Gospel after those 50 days of Easter and the Feast of Pentecost and Trinity. Even if we've been living as a Christian for a long time, we still have things to learn and parts of who we are that can grow and change. We are to be imitators of Christ, living as he did, serving others as he did. What we notice as we read Matthew's Gospel today is firstly a summary of Jesus' many tasks and then in chapter 10, a similar set of tasks for the disciples. At the heart of today's message is Jesus' call to action. The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Perhaps the most prominent thing we notice about Jesus here is that he is filled with compassion and that his compassion sends him out into cities and villages. His task is varied. He is teaching proclaiming the good news and curing every disease and every sickness. I was struck again at the totality of Jesus' ministry and work. He doesn't just pick and choose. He cures every disease and every sickness. I guess that means that he cures sicknesses that are non-medical, as well as those we might understand as an illness of the mind. Or of the heart. And finally, by implication, Jesus cares for and provides the leadership and protection for sheep. For sh he provides the leadership and protection of a shepherd for these people who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus does all that and then he says to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. How does Jesus say these words? Jesus often gets portrayed as gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But perhaps this time he was a bit exasperated with the inactivity and procrastination of his disciples. Perhaps he was sick of them saying that, he, that they couldn't or that they didn't know how. Perhaps he was sick of hearing them blame each other and sick of hearing them make excuses. If we were to take Jesus' words on our own lips, how would we say them? The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Perhaps we've quoted this scripture in an attempt to get more people to do jobs that need to be done. Or we've used it as an excuse for explaining why there's little or nothing, nothing happening in our church. That there's no new people or evangelism, no caring or mission or healing or teaching or proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ because, well, the harvest is plentiful, but we don't have anyone to bring it in. 
just as we're contemplating what this might mean for us, Jesus does the big thing, the best thing for his disciples. He gives them authority and he draws them together with a common purpose to cast out unclean spirits and cure every disease and every sickness. This was just the first step for the disciples. Their ministry was set to grow and change and develop as they followed Jesus and were empowered by the Holy Spirit. These are the very things that we hope for ourselves as Jesus followers today, that we will grow and change and labour happily, willingly and devotedly for the Lord of the harvest. The twelve were just ordinary men, ordinary like us. Some of them were fishermen, some were what we might call political, others were scholars and administrators, and one was even a tax collector. In these men we see weakness, doubt, hot-headedness, fear and insecurity. And who among us cannot identify with such things? Living as a disciple of Christ, living as a good example of faithfulness to the call of Jesus doesn't mean we have to be perfect. But we can just, we are just ordinary, ordinary like those disciples. They were not perfect, but they did commit themselves to the way of Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian, means we have to be it means we don't it doesn't mean that we have to be perfect but it does mean that we have to try to be good at the school gate children are farewelled by their parents with a parting word and if we could listen to them we probably hear things like this don't forget your lunch I love you and have a great day. And among all these parting words, we probably hear this too, be good. Well, to be good is not as simple as it sounds. And perhaps as children, we thought it just meant not to be bad. Don't break the rules. Don't get into trouble. As we grow and mature, we realize that to be a good person to be a good Christian is demanding. It requires focused effort and self-reflection. We're to be a good Christian, not a perfect one. Then we're, there are many challenges and areas of growth ahead of us. Here are just a few to ponder. Firstly, let's try and follow Jesus' example. Jesus does not confine himself to one arena. He went about to all the cities and villages. We might understand this in terms of our own influence. We should not confine it just to our church. Rather, we should take the message, the good news, with us wherever we are and in whatever situation we find ourselves. In school, in the coffee shop, the foot footy club, the office, the car park, anywhere and everywhere really. Similarly, we are to find ways to help those who are sick. Now this means helping the medically unwell, but it also those who need healing in the spiritual sense. Whatever form healing takes, its purpose is to restore people to wholeness, to awaken them to life in all its fullness. Good Christians take the time to read and reflect on scripture. Reading and reflecting on scripture together enriches our Christian life. We need this for ourselves, but we also need it in our toolkit so that we can be more effective at proclaiming the good news. Another important habit for Christians is to set aside time for meaningful prayer. 
It is prayer that draws us deeper and deeper into a relationship with God. Without prayer, we're largely powerless. God wants us to share our lives with him and God wants to share his life with us. Prayer is at the heart of our relationship with God. Finally, we are called upon to help others and make that visible. And those of us who volunteer or belong to service clubs can be confident that here we are following Jesus' example of service and love. the beginning of this ordinary time, this season of growing in our faith, let's hold before us the example of Jesus and in our ordinariness try to be good Christians because the harvest is plentiful and the labourers are few. Let us pray. God of our every day, we pray that you will remind us daily of your son Jesus' call to discipleship. We pray that we will never underestimate our place in the work of your kingdom. Remind us that we are yours and that you are always with us. As your good and faithful people, we commit ourselves again to serve you in our daily lives and to offer you our prayer our time, our very selves. Amen.